Okay, good morning. In this series of lectures, we will be uh, discussing about the course PH151, which is basically a physics first course, which is designed for uh, first semester student of BTEC program of other disciplines. This is a common course. Uh, there is a, a sequel of this course, which will uh, come in the second semester, which is physics second. Now, as far as textbook for this uh, course is concerned, we will be following this as a text Optics by uh, Subramanian and Brislav and uh, I will be teaching the course, part of the course I will be teaching and uh, maybe some of the laboratory classes uh, and some theory classes will be taken by Prochessin uh, In this series of lecture particularly we will be uh, talking about the second part of this course anyway. so I will introduce you what is the course and what are the various parts of this course so primarily this course is uh, divided into uh, laboratory and uh, theory sessions so normally it is uh, defined in terms of credit so uh, this uh, course has 4 credits 3 credits for the theory and 1 credit for the laboratory so basically you will have 3 theory classes uh, in a week and a 2 hours practical session in a week now when you look at the theoretical content of this uh, course then uh, this is basically divided into three parts. The part first is about electromagnetism. Now uh, I briefly describe it anyway. Uh, otherwise, we'll discuss uh, electromagnetism in detail uh, when we we'll discuss the part first. Okay. So electromagnetism is basically a discussion about electricity, magnetism, and electromagnetic waves. Now electricity or electromagnet uh, uh, electricity. Uh, Electricity is basically a uh, behavior of stationary charges and uh, their associated phenomena. Magnetism is uh, when the charge is in movement and there are certain associated phenomena, there are certain concepts, certain laws which we will discuss about. So that comes under the uh, topic of magnetism. Then there is the third topic uh, which is electromagnetic wave. Now electromagnetic wave is basically coupled electric and magnetic vibrations. Uh, which propagate with the velocity of light. Now this uh, this concept or this this was first time investigated by Maxwell, and then there are many uh, many concepts or many things which you require to understand about electromagnetic waves, how it propagates, what will be the effect on the properties of electromagnetic wave when it interacts with the matter, and so and so. So all these things will be discussed in the part first. So it is basically an electromagnetic theory course. The second part is of physical optics. Now physical optics is basically the nature of light, how it is produced, how it propagates and how it interacts with matter basically. Uh, mainly in this portion we will be discussing about physical optics only. Now physical optics is basically the wave life phenomenon, uh, wave, wave life phenomena uh, exhibited by the light basically and basically interference, diffraction and polarization will be the uh, main concern here. And in the third part, we talk about elementary quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics is uh, uh, modern physics basically, uh, which says that uh, light also behaves like a particle. And later on, this concept has uh, uh, led to the development of dual nature of matter also. So, particle behaves like a wave, wave behaves like a particle. And then there are certain uh, other associated consequences and properties. So, all those things will be discussed in the quantum mechanics course. So this is uh, about the course anyway. Now we formally start uh, the discussion of second part basically which is optics. Now what is optics all about basically? Now when you uh, think about optics basically we have or when you think about light we have many questions. What is light? What is it made of? How it is produced? How it propagates? What is its velocity? And so and so. So optics is a branch where we try to answer all these questions. Now optics is, if you try to define optics as a branch of physics, then you say that optics describes the phenomenon and various laws associated with the generation, propagation, generation and propagation of light and its interaction with the matter. So we talk about all these things, various laws, various phenomena which are, which are observed uh, with light when it is propagating, when it is following certain conditions and so and so. Now, to start with the discussion of various phenomena associated with the light and various laws, I will just uh, go through a 
certain important developments in the history of light accident. Uh, what is light, how it behaves and so and so. So there are some important theories and mainly there are four important theories. The first one is a very old one which is due to Newton basically or the credit goes to Newton anyway. It was postulated earlier also but formally it was uh, uh, defined, it was uh, postulated by Newton. This is known as corpuscular uh, theory. Now in this theory it was postulated that every luminous body emits tiny light elastic particles which are known as corpuscles. Okay? Now these corpuscles are very very small. They can travel through the interstices uh, of the matter basically. So there are some uh, very minute spaces, uh, uh, space or smaller space available in between the particles of the matter. So these corpuscles can travel between these minute, uh, through these minute spaces and uh, with the velocity of light. And they possess the properties of reflection and refraction. So they show reflection, they show reflection and they travel in a straight line. When these particles fall on the retina, retina of our eye, then they produce certain kind of a sensation. So we see the light. So this was the basic assumption made by Newton and uh, some Greek people before Newton and Newton. This was uh, conceptualized in the 1657. Now when these particles fall on retina, they produce the sensation and And this theory could explain reflection, refraction and the rectilinear propagation of light. Now when I say rectilinear propagation means there was uh, there were evidences available that the light travels in a straight line. So this theory or based on this theory we can uh, prove that the light travels with the, uh, in the straight line. So this is the first one. The second theory is wave theory of light. Now in this theory we assume that the, the light behaves like a wave. And the theory is due to Christian Heiden. In 1679, first time he uh, proposed this particular hypothesis that a luminous body is in general a source of various disturbances and these disturbances propagate, uh, propagate in a hypothetical medium which is known as ether. So Christian Heiden has uh, assumed or uh, postulated a particular medium and this medium exists everywhere in the space. So we say that the medium prevails everywhere. So when you uh, assume that every illuminating body is the source of disturbances and those disturbances are propagating in a medium which is known as ether and this medium is available everywhere in the space. When these vibrations, so these disturbances basically carrying energy are incident on I, our optic now, you know, I has an optic now basically, so that optic now is excited and these vibrations uh, is excited and we are able to see the light basically. Now, along with these assumptions, Heiden has also assumed that these vibrations are longitudinal in nature. Okay, so because when you talk about a wave or a wave nature, then always you need to define that which kind of wave is it. So whether it is a transverse or longitudinal. So Christian Heiden says that these vibrations are longitudinal in nature. Now, if you follow these postulates, then uh, this theory, basically, or these postulates could explain reflection, refraction, rectilinear propagation of light interference, deflection, etc, etc. Because the wave nature has been considered. So when interference and deflection, we will talk about these phenomena and interference and deflection later on in detail anyway. So, this could explain everything including reflection, reflection, uh, rectilinear propagation of light, interference and deflection. But it was not possible to explain polarization with the help of this uh, wave theory. But later on, uh, two more genius uh, scientists, Wagner and yeah, in 1801, I have suggested that okay, instead of considering the longitudinal nature of the vibrations, they are in fact transverse vibrations. And if you include that hypothesis or that postulate uh, with the uh, assumption of uh, uh, with, uh, with, with the assumptions of Christian Heiden, then it could explain the polarization as well. So, with the inclusion of this transverse nature of vibration, uh, this wave theory of light could explain all the wave phenomena interference, deflection, polarization, polarization, along with the other old phenomena uh, observed uh, with the corpuscular theory, also reflection, reflection, and rectilinear yeah, propagation of light. So this is uh, a brief about the uh, wave nature. Anyway, we'll talk about all these phenomena in detail. So uh, now the third one is electromagnetic.
in detail. This uh, portion we will discuss in detail in the first part of this course anyway. Electricity uh, and magnetism diesel basically. Now we are, uh, we are talking about light basically and the electromagnetic theory uh, gives an important understanding about the light also. Electric basically what Maxwell says that electric and magnetic vibrations are coupled together and they travel with the velocity of light. And these vibrations are transverse in nature. Initially Maxwell has assumed that these, uh, there is an existence of ether medium which was uh, postulated by earlier people anyway. So he initially started with that hypothesis that there is a presence of medium called ether. But later on Michelson and Morley in 1987 has uh, Michelson and Morley have proved that there is no such medium exists. Uh, there is no such medium called ether anyway. It's uh, uh, through an experiment anyway which is very famous and which is known as Michelson and Morley experiment. Through that uh, Michelson and Morley proved that there is no uh, medium ether. We will discuss about this part anyway. So important, the most important part here is why we talk about uh, electromagnetic theory of light because through or after this analysis or after the prediction of Maxwell it was considered that light is also an electromagnetic radiation or is a, uh, an electromagnetic wave which has electric and magnetic field coupled together and travelling with the velocity of light. Then lastly, uh, the fourth one is a quantum theory which is very very important because this theory uh, provides us the understanding about various microscopic uh, things anyway, behaviour of electron in matter, behaviour of uh, small particles and so, so many things are behavior of materials and anyway, how they behave when you go to the very smaller smaller scale anyway. and nanotechnology or nanoscience is also part of that anyway. so nanoscience nanotechnology can only be explained with the help of quantum theory and a part of uh, nuclear physics solid state physics because in nuclear physics also we talk about very small particles electron um, proton and many other uh, small particles okay, which are uh, very small in the same now, uh, quantum mechanics basically, or quantum theory started with uh, the black body experiment basically. So, there was a classic experiment. We will discuss this experiment in the uh, quantum physics when, in the part 3 of this syllabus. A black body radiation experiment. And this black body radiation experiment results could not be explained with the help of earlier theories, with the help of the classical physics, wave theory of light, and all that, all that, your theory of radiation. Then, Planck has postulated that. Uh, the radiations which are coming from uh, an illuminating body or all the radiations are basically in form of a particle and that particle is later on named as a photon so it carries certain amount of energy so basically the, 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 the summary or the brief uh, statement if I say a brief statement about the quantum theory then this is that uh, light appears like a particle and the particle is known as it's a bundle of energy which is known as photon now uh, if I consider uh, light as a particle, then the interference, diffraction, and polarization phenomena cannot be explained with the help of particle energy. So this was the contradiction anyway. But at the same time, the, the, the very most uh, prominent effects which were observed uh, a little before uh, 19, uh, start of the 20th century basically, photoelectric effect and counter effect is uh, an effect which was observed in 1923. I think. So all these uh, uh, observations could be explained with the help of particle nature or with the help of uh, hypothesis of photon. So it's a kind of a situation, certain phenomena you can explain with the help of uh, wave nature of light and there are certain other experiments or other observations which you can explain with the help of particle nature. So it's a kind of a mixed understanding and this development has led to the understanding of dual nature of light and dual nature of uh, later on it has uh, conceptualized into a dual nature of medium. So this is uh, the quantum theory anyway. So these are the, uh, uh, a very brief introduction about various uh, theories uh, which exist in the history for the light basically. Now we come to the uh, a formal dis uh, we start the formal discussion of optics basically. And in optics anyway as I told you uh, the production of light, how the light is produced, how it behaves, what are the various properties of light and so on and so So we talk about, uh, first of all we talk about sources of light. Now how light is produced basically, there are many many or there are many popular ways by which you can produce the light. Now one of them is thermal radiation. Now thermal radiation is very simple thing anyway, when you heat, when you provide heat energy to 
a certain substance, it radiates basically. Now, in certain conditions, I will, for, uh, if the temperature belongs to a particular range, then these, these radiations which are coming out from the, a body which is at the temperature, you can see those radiations. Otherwise, the radiations are not visible, means they are not, uh, our eyes are not responding to that. But every material object, if it is kept at a constant temperature, it releases certain kind of radiations which are known as thermal radiations. So if you keep a material object at a particular temperature, then there is a possibility that you see that the radiations, you can see the radiations and those radiations are basically uh, visible uh, electromagnetic radiations or you can say a visible light basically or a light visible. Then there is another way by which you can produce the uh, light which is luminescence and again I mean, luminescence can be characterized into three different categories so there are many more electroluminescence, chemical luminescence, photoluminescence. Now in case of electroluminescence it is basically the charged particle when it is the accelerated charged particle is interacting with the particles of an atom or uh, constituent of an atom they, they create basically certain flashes and you want to use another blue light so basically based on the principle of electroluminescence. Chemical uh, luminescence, this is basically a natural or uh, in certain uh, natural uh, species also this kind of phenomenon is observed. Otherwise, I mean, in general it is uh, light produced due to a chemical reaction. Now, fireflies, you might have noticed anyway, that the, that the firefly uh, flies produce light, so that is basically because of the chemical reaction happening in their body. Fishes, there are certain fishes and bacteria which, which are, uh, which flashes basically. Uh, you can see the light flash coming from their body. And photoluminescence is a, a phenomenon uh, when you have a phosphorus coating on a certain surface and then, uh, then you produce this, uh, the light is produced when certain uh, particles and anyway, sometimes electrons, sometimes other charged particles strikes on this uh, phosphorus screen and the whole TV screen anyway, the picture tube kind of screen is not LEDs and LEDs basically. So all picture tubes are basically having this mechanism of production of light. Now, there are certain very important things and here you need to know before going into the detail of interference, diffraction and polarization. So here I just introduce you anyway. You have already studied about all these phenomena in your uh, elementary classes. But anyway, I am just giving you a brief idea about that or I am just reminding you all those concepts. Now, reflection is when a light traveling in a medium encounters a boundary leading to a second medium or in a different way, if you have a boundary between two mediums and if the light is incident on that boundary, then what happens? Certain portion of the light comes back to the medium first. Now here you can see in this picture you have a white region here which is a medium first. There is another reason which is a medium uh, second and the light, this is your incident light. So light incident on this point which is on the surface the some portion of the light goes back to the uh, same medium and this phenomena is known as reflection of light uh, reflection of light now you have uh, there, 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 uh, there are certain ways to measure the, uh, the, the, the properties of reflection anyway or the things associated uh, to make the observation you need certain quantities so we define uh, a normal to the surface here which is a very thin dotted line here which is uh, probably not visible in the the slide, but there is a normal, so this is normal to the surface, this is your incident ray, and this is your ray. Now, there are certain laws which are always uh, followed by this phenomenon, and uh, the laws are basically this incident. The first law is the incident ray, the reflected ray, and the normal to the surface. All three lies in the same plane, so they don't go out of the plane in any case. All, all three of them remain in the same plane. So if you consider this blackboard as a plane and the light is something uh, incident in this direction then the light will remain on the blackboard and it will never travel out of the blackboard. So this is one law which says that the normal incident ray and the reflected ray all will remain in the same plane. The second law says that the angle of incidence. Now when I say angle of incidence it is basically the angle which incident ray match with the normal. So this is incident angle, this is uh, angle of refraction. So angle of incidence is equal to the angle of refraction. This is the second law and which is always true. So this is about the refraction. Now there is another phenomenon which is observed in the same situation basically, a refraction. Now refraction is, as I say, that when you incident 
light ray on a boundary between two different mediums having different properties basically then some portion of the light goes back to the same medium but there is because energy is conserved anyway so you cannot destroy the energy you can convert energy from one form to another and light is also a form of energy so when some portion of the light is going in the same medium then remaining goes to the second medium so this portion the light which is uh, going to the second medium is basically a reflected ray now refraction it's, it's not like that when there is a change in the medium the light does not go uh, does not follow the same path basically there is a change in the path or you can say the light ray bends so when, whenever there is a boundary between the two surfaces or two mediums and the light transmits to the second medium then it will reflect from its path and this reflection is basically known as refraction of light now again there are certain laws which are always followed by this uh, phenomena now again we have a normal to the surface so in this case incident ray normal and the refracted ray which is going to the second medium all remains in the same plane so basically you can say that the incident ray normal to the surface reflected ray and reflected ray all of them remain in the same plane they don't change plane basically or they don't go out of the blackboard. If I consider my blackboard or whiteboard as a plane, then they don't go out of the plane in any case. The second law, which is uh, which says that if I consider this angle as an angle of incidence, and again if I have a normal here, and if I measure this angle, the angle which reflected ray is matching with the norm. This is known as angle of reflection basically. It is denoted by theta t here. And even sometimes uh, uh, it is angle of uh, theta rf also uh, used for the notation. So if I consider the sine of this angle of incidence divided by sine of the angle of reflection, which is sine of theta t. So sine of theta i over sine of theta t, it remains constant. So sine of angle of incidence to the sine of angle of reflection is constant. And this constant is basically equal to the relative reflective index of the combination of these two indexes. Now when I say relative reflective index, we will define this and you what it is, what is reflective index and what do we mean by relative reflective index. Okay? So right now we may just consider that it is uh, the, the ratio of the sign of angle of incidence to the sign of angle of uh, refraction is constant. Okay? Now we come to the definition of the reflective index. Now the reflective index this is defined for a particular medium. The refractive index is defined as the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in that medium. Now, you might be, uh, you might have studied anyway when light travels in vacuum, then its speed is the maximum, which is basically considered as the highest 3 to 10 is power 8 meter per second. But when it travels through other mediums, maybe air or maybe other than air and in a certain dense medium then the, it becomes slow so the velocity of light is highest in the vacuum and then in other mediums which is the, uh, the, the light travels slow so if I consider a particular medium then I can define the refractive index of that medium by the ratio of the velocity of light in vacuum divided by the velocity of light in that medium and this value will definitely and comes out to be larger than 1 always for every medium and for air it is almost or very very near to 1 and it's very small difference I think it is 1.0003 so you can consider the reflective index of light, uh, reflective index of light, uh, reflective index of air is 1 okay. so this is how we define reflective index now we define relative reflective index now suppose instead of having a combination of air and a medium suppose if you have two different mediums anyway, one is medium 1, another is medium 2 and one of them is not airless then you define the relative refractive index and the relative refractive index is denoted by mu 2 which is mu 2 by mu 1 anyway mu 2 is the refractive index of medium 2 refractive index of medium 1 now as you know from this definition you can say it is c by v2 v2 is the velocity of light in the medium 2 v1 is the velocity of light in medium 1 so this comes out to be v1 by v2 
So you can say relative refractive index is basically the ratio of the velocities of light in two metals. In earlier case, I mean, as I have explained the refraction and reflection, we suppose this is not air anyway, you have medium one air, medium two air, then the refractive index, the law of uh, sine of angle of incidence to the sine of angle of uh, refraction will be equal to mu one two, and which remains constant always. Okay, so this is what. Refractive index is fine. Now, the next concept here is optical path. Now, what is optical path? Now, as I told you, when light travels in air, its velocity is almost equal to the velocity of light in vacuum because light, air has a refractive index equals to 1. But other than air, if the light travels in other medium, then it travels with a velocity which is slower than the velocity of light in air. Now here I use two notations basically the velocity V which is in a medium and velocity C which is in the vacuum basically. So now suppose a line is traveling a distance L. This is a physical distance basically in a given medium with a velocity V in time t. Then according to anyway uh, uh, with with our knowledge of definition of velocity, we can say L equals to velocity into time. Now, if I consider the same time interval and calculate that how much distance light travels in air in the same time interval. So, if light travels L distance in time t in a medium, then light travels delta distance in air in the same time interval because the velocity of light is c time interval we are considering the same so this is the distance this notation is used for the optical path anyway so this delta is the distance travelled by light in vacuum in the same time this is the equivalent distance basically so if a light is travelling in a medium and it is passing through or it is travelling a distance l then we calculate an equivalent distance in air basically and how much distance the light will travel in medium air at the same time and that is basically c into t now this t we can replace from this uh, expression so this is l by v here and if i consider this c by v as a combination because c by v you know uh, mu which is refractive index so this is c by v so this c and this c it can be termed as mu so this becomes a general definition of optical path now Whenever a light is travelling in a medium, you can always calculate a corresponding optical path for that medium. And that optical path, if L is the geometrical distance travelled by light in that medium, because this L is the actual distance, the physical distance which light is travelling in that medium, and this mu is the refractive index of that medium. So you multiply refractive index and then actual distance travelled by light in that medium, which gives you the optical. Uh, so in general you can say optical path is the refractive index multiplied by the geometrical path. Geometrical path is the actual or physical distance by light. Now in general, in a given time, suppose you have a specific time interval, then the optical path remains seen for all the videos. Because if, if a time interval is defined, then the distance travelled by light in air in that time interval will remain same. For all the mediums anyway, the optical path remains same. So this is about optical path. Now we come to the next concept anyway, which is again, I think uh, you have studied this in detail in your class, dispersion of light. Now when I say dispersion of light, uh, one important point anyway which I missed probably the refractive in the discussion of refractive. Index here. The last line. The refractive index of the medium depends on the medium, of course, because we are talking about the medium, the level, the velocity of light in that medium, but it also depends on the wavelength of the light. Because you know, light is, uh, light consists of various different wavelengths ranging from 4000 angstrom to 8000 angstrom. So, variety of uh, wavelengths are available. Uh, you probably know the definition of the So, when you talk about a different wavelength, then the refractive index may be different for different wavelengths, and it is in fact different anyway. 
and if it is not specified in any uh, example or in any case, then it is generally coated for the yellow color. So whenever it is simply written as a refractive index is 1.5, it means it is calculated for yellow color. And yellow color has a wavelength and yellow, you know, yellow color has uh, a wavelength approximately 5890 and probably I've seen sodium lamp in the laboratory, or maybe uh, you will see uh, sodium lamp in your laboratory session. So this is uh, the wavelength which we consider. And if it is written that mu equals to 1.5, then it means for a medium, it means that this refractive index has been calculated for a yellow color. So remember uh, this kind of this. Now coming to the discussion uh, again. Now as I say that the refractive index depends on the wavelength. Now suppose you have a medium which has certain properties. Take an example of a piece of glass anyway, or a prism a diagram is in front of you, uh, which is known as prism diagram. So if you have a white light, now you know white light, light is a mixture of various wavelengths ranging from 4000 to 8000. So all different colors are there mixed together and you don't see them clearly but it's a mixture of all different colors uh, means different wavelengths basically when this white light passes through a medium what happens because as you know refractive index depends on the wavelength so white light consists of various wavelengths so all of them will have different different refractive indices and because of that they will separate out themselves and as a result of this action, what will happen? All the colors will be separated into different colors because one will move faster, another will move slower and the reflection will also be at a different angle. So as a result of this phenomenon, you see that the, all the colors go, are going in a different direction and this phenomenon is known as dispersion of light. Okay? So the white light passing through a medium will be separated according to their color. One more thing, the, the reflection, because what you see here, this is the source of light anyway. If it, if it does not dis, de deflect from its path, then it goes in straight like this. But what is happening here? You have a wide boundary over here. So a reflection is taking place here. Again, you have a boundary between glass and air. So one more reflection is taking place here. And as a result of this, uh, what is happening? The light, uh, the red color is uh, deflected by the smallest angle and the violet one is uh, deflected by the largest angle. So this phenomenon is known as uh, dispersion of light. You might have observed this in the uh, dispersion in the laboratory also in the class. Now, in the next sequence of properties of light, we have electromagnetic spectrum. Now, electromagnetic spectrum is just arrangement of all electromagnetic waves according to their wavelength. So all kind of electromagnetic waves which exist in nature basically. So if you arrange them according to the uh, increasing order of their wavelength or decreasing order of their wavelength, this is known as electromagnetic spectrum. Now if you can read the, the diagram here, now here it is according to the wavelength anyway, so the scale on the axis is you can assume as a wavelength. Here it is, uh, you can see anywhere diagram, this is a wavelength or a, a picture of a wave, yeah. And this is again some pulses of a wavelength. You can notice here the wavelength field is larger, the wavelength field is smaller. Okay. So it's basically the decreasing order of the wavelength. Now when I say decreasing order of the wavelength, it is basically because you know energy. Energy is H nu or it is and C by length. So if wavelength increases, energy is small. So if lambda is large, it means is small. Right? So this is what you need to remember. Or we say frequency is small. So any of the parameters you can use for the classification. Here I have used lambda as a parameter. So I have arranged all the electromagnetic radiation with respect to lambda anyway. So this is decreasing lambda. Or you can say it is a direction in which the energy is increasing. Or frequency is increasing. Now you can notice here, there are some vertical lines which are basically just some boundaries or are defining the boundaries between the two different categories of waves. So here it is radio waves, then it is microwaves, infrared, 
ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. And you know, gamma rays are the most energetic radiations, and X-rays are uh, having little less energy than the gamma rays, and the ultraviolet radiations are different. And sometimes you know, uh, your skin may burn, and you know, if you have ultraviolet radiations coming to the uh, surface of the heart. And there is a very small portion which is shown by the color. This is in fact the visible portion. And this visible portion is basically 4000 and is from to 7000 or 8000 angstrom. Now, angstrom, you know, angstrom is basically n is for minus 10. Is equal to n is for 10 mm -hmm. meters. So you can convert any way. Rowlet is in general specified in terms of angstrom. So this is the small portion we are talking about, which is a visible portion. Then you can anyway you have a scale here, this is 1 meter, this is 10 to the minus 1 meter, minus 2 meter, minus uh, 3, minus 4, like that. Okay. So you can easily understand here, this is 10 to the minus uh, 6, minus 7, or something like that. Okay, so you can just see. This is what uh, visible spectrum is. So this is known as electromagnetic spectrum, or arrangement of uh, electromagnetic radiations uh, with respect to their environment. And then there is a classification also, and that classification gives you different category of electromagnetic radiations. Now, why we why why we uh, categorize these radiations? Because every radiation, every set of radiations has different properties. So uh, we can define their properties with respect to their time basically. Now, coming to now the interference of light. Now, before understanding the actual phenomena of phenomena of interference you need to understand certain facts about the uh, light and the properties and certain definitions also. So we start with now light wave. Now when I say light wave, as I told you, Maxwell has predicted that light is an electromagnetic radiation which has electric and magnetic vibrations coupled together. Now if I be more specific about electromagnetic radiation or about uh, light, then it has electric vibrations and magnetic vibrations perpendicular to each other. Now here in this diagram anyway, you can just notice that this is the direction of propagation. This arrow is basically direction of propagation. And then you can say, uh, you can see that this red color path, basically it is a horizontal. So suppose you have a direction of propagation like this, then you have a pulse or a wave propagating or having vibration in the horizontal plane, which is basically your electric field. So electric field vibrations are horizontal and then you see a blue pulse here which is a vertical wave. So you have vibrations in the vertical plane. So you have three different directions here. One is the direction of propagation, another is the direction of electric field which is the horizontal plane and the, the direction of the vibration of your magnet. So three directions are involved and all three are mutually perpendicular. Now if I consider this direction as a z direction and the direction of electric field is x direction, then y would be the direction of your magnetic field. Now if I represent these things in a mathematical way, then electric field, amplitude of electric energy, this is the sine wave energy, you know, uh, you know, the sine wave is something like this, and this. Now this is the representation, this is the amplitude, which is the maximum amplitude, you can say, this is E naught here. So E naught sine of K is minus omega. Now this is basically your direction of this is direction of propagation sign. Now this k is what? This k is 2 pi by lambda, which is known as a wave vector. Okay? This omega is angular frequency, which is related to frequency anyway. This is to pi Okay? Anyway, it is written here. So, frequency can be defined as omega by 2 pi. So, this is sine of kz minus omega t. Now, this is just the phase factor anyway, which says that where the wave starts basically. If it is starting at the 0 anyway, if at t equals to 0, this is uh, minimum. Then you can consider this as a 0 or some. Uh, if it shifts by a certain amount, then this term will exist here. So, this is how we represent the wave. So this is electric field, this is magnetic field. Okay? Now when you combine them anyway, or if you use a, a notation of your unit vector also here, which is Ax or A minus. So this is 
is in the x direction, this is in the y direction. And then we could remove the things from here. Be more specific about that. Then this is ax and this is a. Means it is entirely in the x direction, it is entirely in the y direction. And then z is the direction of propagation. Okay. Now we talk about certain properties of this kind of a wave uh, basically. Now here the wave has a single frequency which is uh, defined by mu omega rho 2. Now there are certain more uh, things here. It is a harmonic wave which is having infinite extension and here. Whenever you talk about light anyway, it goes infinite, it goes up to infinite in the positive direction, it goes up to infinite in the negative direction. So this harmonic wave has an extension from minus infinity to plus infinity. The amplitude of wave is constant anyway. So this 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 size anyway, or this distance remains same throughout. When the wave is traveling from minus infinity to plus infinity, this remains constant, which is the amplitude of the uh, wave basically or amplitude of the I normally consider electric field as an amplitude anyway. You can consider the magnetic field also. Then electric field as as a if electric field is oscillating parallel to a fixed direction, as I uh, explained, electric field is oscillating only in the x direction. Okay. In that case, this kind of wave is known as or is said as linearly polarized light. So you can say the light wave is polarized in x direction because the electric field always remains in the x direction throughout the space. This is linearly polarized or plane polarized. We will talk about these polarization modes in the uh, polarization chapter in detail. Right? Now, very very important fact which you should always remember before discussing these interference reflection and all these phenomena. Now, this important fact is a real light, light coming from uh, sources, ordinary sources, the common sources which are available to us, is way is not ideal anyway. Ideal in the sense the properties have are different than the properties which we discussed. Okay. So the, the light coming from the common shore is different or is far from ideal means they are not infinite in extension first of all. They are real, they are finite wavelengths. They are not infinite in extension. They have always have a finite length. They have spread of frequency. Their frequency is not a unique frequency, is not constant throughout the anyway. There is a variation in the frequency. So frequency exists in a band basically. Even though it is very specific shows that there, there also there is a range of frequencies in the world. And the last one, they are not plane polarized. Means that electric field is not always aligned in a unique direction, in a single direction. So because of this wave trace anyway, so you have different different uh, short uh, wave pulses coming out from the uh, shores anyway, maybe some natural phenomena, some force phenomena, and through which uh, you have uh, finite length wavelengths which are having different frequencies and they are, they are not plane polarized means they are, their electric field is not aligned in a single direction. So you have mix of frequencies available. So always a common light source is uh, not producing a unique frequency wave which are infinite in extension and plane polarized. And the other fact anyway, the light travels over in an optical medium, which you know anyway, you don't need to discuss. The next one is the concept of phase difference and coherence. Now, when I say phase difference and coherence, phase difference is very, very simple. Now suppose you have two waves. If I draw here two waves of same frequency, now I just mark the corresponding points here. Now if you remember the definition of wavelength, this distance is known as length. And if you remember anyway, it is a perfectly assigned wave, then this is 0, pi by 2, and pi. No? No, no, no. It is not 0, pi by 2, it is 0, sorry, it is pi, and this is 2 pi. And this is basically pi by 2. So now, suppose you have a wave which has a different behavior means So this is again like this Again this 
this is your 0, this is your pi by 2, this is your pi, this is your 3 pi by 2, and this is 2. Now both of them have the same wavelength anyway, you can just find out uh, from here. This is the wavelength for this one. For this case. So the wavelength is same means they have the same frequency, but they are starting point to their corresponding points are different anyway. Now there is a difference anyway because corresponding points means the maxima uh, of this wave or you can say tough and crust basically so the maxima of this wave is observed at pi and maxima of this wave is observed at pi by 2 so there is a phase difference and it is equal to pi by 2 pm now you may have a situation where the wave is completely shifted by pi then what happens in that case? In that case you will see, you will not see any difference in the picture as well. Because when it will be shifted completely by a, a phase of 2 pi. So if it is shifted by 2 pi, then there will be no phase difference you can say. So if it is 0 or 2 pi, then there is no difference in the picture you will observe. But if it is pi by 2 or 3 by pi 2 or pi, then you will see the difference. So this is basically defined as a uh, phase difference. Now, just read this slide anyway. Uh, there are two things which are written here. If the frequencies of two waves are different, now here in this picture which I have drawn here, the frequency uh, frequencies were same, the length was uh, same for both the cases. But if the frequencies of two waves are different, then the phase difference between them will change with the time. Now, if they have different different frequencies, means one wave is having something like this. And another wave has a picture like this. Now in both the cases, the wavelength here and wavelength here is different. So if you continuously observe this wave for the infinite extension, then you will find at this point the phase difference is something else, at the other point the phase difference is something else, phase difference is. So the phase difference does not remain constant throughout the space throughout the time. If you observe it uh, in the space or if you observe with respect to time, that is, if the frequencies are different, so this is what I mentioned, the frequency is different and their phase difference changes with time. Secondly, if the frequency of one wave changes regularly, now if suppose frequency of one wave is constant and the frequency of second wave changes regularly, then also the phase difference changes regularly. Why? Because suppose this wave remains the same, but this wave changes its shape, means its wavelength changes as you move in the space or if you observe with respect to time then you find that the, the phase difference at every point in time if you observe it on every point in space you will find that the phase difference is regularly changing so these are now these kind of waves are known as incorrect waves means if there is a mismatch in their frequencies or their frequencies are different and even though both of them are having constant frequencies but different then they are incoherent waves or secondly if one of if one of the waves frequency is changing regularly and another wave has a constant wave then also their their phase difference does not remain constant over the time of the space so these kind of waves are known as uh, incoherent waves now contrary to that suppose if you have waves which have the same frequencies Okay, so into two waves of the same frequencies. Now here, which is important, uh, the one important point here, the amplitude may be different. You may have a situation that their amplitude are, amplitudes are same or their amplitudes are different. So if you have two waves of same frequency, then they always maintain a phase relationship. As I mentioned earlier in the way, through the diagram, that if there may be a phase difference of zero. Now, if their frequencies are same, then the phase difference will remain zero throughout the space throughout the time. If there is a phase difference of pi by 2 initially, means the wave is shifted by an angle of pi by 2, then you will observe that the, the wave everywhere you will find that both the waves are shifted by an angle of pi by 2. So this does not change with time, and this is what uh, we say when their phase relationship there is a predictable phase relationship and which remains constant throughout. So now this phase difference may be any value between 
zero to two pi. Now why? It cannot exceed two pi because I mean when when it is two pi, then you see a resemblance in the picture basically. You, know, you you don't see a difference between the two waves basically. So the maximum phase difference you can say is two pi. It may be multiple of uh, it is a multiple of two pi, but it is equivalent to zero. So the phase difference would be always between zero to two pi. Right? And if this is the case, then these waves, which are having same frequencies and maintain a predictable phase relationship throughout the space throughout the time, then they are known as coherent waves. Okay? So this is very important for interference basically because when you talk about interference anyway you need to know first about what is coherent uh, what are coherent waves basically okay. coming to the next I think uh, for today it is enough the time is uh, approaching now uh, so we will discuss this concept uh, with, uh, I will just stop here with the coherent waves in the next class, I will start with this optical part difference, phase change, and then leading to the discussion of interference of light and other uh, related. Okay, thank you very much.